All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to welcome back Mr. Roy Osing, who is in Vancouver in Canada. How are you doing, Roy? Hey, I'm doing well, John. Thanks very much for uh, taking the chance to have me back. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and Roy's the former president, CMO and entrepreneur with over 40 years of successful and unmatched leadership experience in every aspect of business. Uh, and he took one uh, company from early stage to one billion in a- annual sales. And he's a multiple author. But today we're going to talk about this book here. Yay. And it is. It's Be Different or Be Dead, The Audacious Unheard of Ways I Took a Startup to a Billion in Sales. So, um, Roy, just the start of it, I always like to ask when somebody brings out a new book, um, what was the what was the genesis of the thought behind this particular book? Um, as you're well, a pretty prolific writer. <laughs> well, the genesis was that is was actually uh, was actually the previous six books that I've I've written around my my work, which is Be Different or Be Dead. And the need that I felt, particularly in these challenging times for organizations and for individuals to actually update it and give it a bit more of a, of a fresh uh, look and feel. Because, John, as you know, whenever we, we do a lot of work with our own work, we learn more about our own work. And so for me, it's been a long journey on figuring out how this be different um, concept would apply in the world and trying to convince people people that it's a reasonable journey to me on. So um, it just kind of evolved out of that need to update, provide fresh insights, etc. And so, uh, yeah, we published in the at the end of May. And and so far, I'm, I'm happy, uh, anecdotally, at least with the kind of response it's received. Excellent. And so um, one of the first things you talk about in the book is about leadership, right? Uh, and, you know, you say that textbook leadership is dead and and i find and i find today like there are so many people have so many um ideas around leadership and you know a lot of it is straight over you once upon a time it was command and control now it's like authenticity openness you know transparency be really you know all of this kind of stuff and it's just i mean if you're if you're a new leader today i i'm sure you're like completely confused and if not and if not a little schizophrenic because you're being told all these different things that you're supposed to do um, so what say you well what say i is 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 founded in what actually worked as opposed to you know theoretical concepts and 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 that sort of thing my uh, my um, work on leadership was all based on execution and achieving high levels of performance and what it took for me as a president of a data company to actually build it into a billion dollars worth of annual revenue. I, um, I believe that, that leadership education is important, John. The problem that I have, and that's kind of like the genesis of my remarks around textbooks, mm-hmm. the, 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 the remark I have, though, is it simply doesn't go far enough. It doesn't teach people in the real world the essential things that that they need to do as a leader to actually drive performance. You know, it's not about style, right? It's about what are the essential things that as a leader we have to do to drive the bottom line performance of the business. Uh, So for me, the things I did, um, which in some cases people thought were crazy, weren't done just because they were cool and crazy. They were done because I actually discovered that they work like performance. Let me give you a couple of examples. And, and, and yeah. so I fundamentally uh, define uh, my kind of audacious leadership take in four ways, right? And the first piece deals with you have to be different to survive and thrive. And that piece mm-hmm. is huge in terms of what you need to do in an organization in order to achieve that. And we can come back to that if you want, but I just want to get these four out. The second piece yeah. is you need to execute to perform and grow. This isn't about studying things. It's not about pondering things. It's not about having things theoretically pristine. It's about getting things just about right and executing them flawlessly in the world because that's where performance comes from and that's where leadership needs to spend their time and they don't today. The third piece is about servant leadership. Now, I got a real issue with this because everybody talks about servant leadership as a ship. Well, it's not. 
It's a choice mm -hmm. that a leader makes to do certain things that drives the execution of the plan of the business. And so it's tactical. So I had to recreate it and, and I ended up calling it leadership by serving around. And so my definition is all about asking people, how can I help? It's a personal commitment. You're in the workplace all the time and you're doing things to make it easier for people to execute your plan. Right. So that's the leadership by serving around piece. And the last piece I find interesting because I'm a believer in strategic micromanagement. And so there's the fourth piece of audacious leadership is micromanage. Do it yourself because there's certain things that we should never be delegating. And yet the textbooks say to be a good leader, you have to delegate. Well, I got one word for that. Bullshit. That's not right. Mm -hmm. You may be, you may get around away with delegating some of the operational mundaneness in front of you. Okay. But you should never delegate the things that are critical to your strategy. And so that it, for me described the whole scenario of what we had to do as, as leaders to actually progress the business. So be different, execute, serve, and do it yourself. Those are the four planks of, of how I view audacious leadership. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with you. And I think, as, as you rightly pointed out there, that a lot of your job as a leader is is to go around with a, with a truck or one of those diggers or whatever and remove obstacles and barriers to your organization, your team's ability to succeed. You should be always looking for how can I, how can I remove barriers so that they, they can be successful. And I agree with you too, is you need to continue to have your finger on the pulse and, and understand what, you know, really understand what's going on. But I wanted to pick up on one thing because yeah, style is definitely a, a, a focus area now where pe people are so worried about like how I'm perceived, my style, am I vulnerable enough? Am I, a, you know, all of this kind of stuff, as opposed to looking again, as we said, is looking at how can I help the people around me to do their jobs and to be successful? Because at the end of the day, if, if everybody's moving forward and those are happy people. Look at, look at, it's really simple, right? Today, uh, the, the, the sort of science or art of leadership is all about, say, narcissism. It's what do I have to be myself to comply with the traditional norms of the day? Well, that's about you as a person. It's not about what you should be doing as a leader to promulgate uh, extraordinary performance. And so the style experts are, you know, are sort of like the people that says, well, you know, you need to do your hair a certain way. <laughs> I keep asking, well, why are we doing that? Okay, so why are we promulgating certain leadership principles? In my world, leaders do one and only one thing. They're responsible for the execution of the business plan of the organization and driving superlative performance. Everything that they do needs to be relatable to that. Now, okay, if the color of their hair okay, is a relevant determinant of performance, then I say, let's, let's consider that. I doubt that mm -hmm. we'll ever get there. What I discovered right. were the simple little things, okay, around that. Now, you mentioned getting rid of, of barriers. Like, I, I created this, this program in, in my business, actually turned into part of the culture called Cut the Crap. You and I have talked about this before. Mm -hmm. Cut the Crap is about, you know, some people would say, well, it's about eliminating non strategies and I, I would always say, no, it's about cutting the crap because everybody right. knows it's crap that gets in, in the way of their goals, right? So it was part of my clean the inside, cleanse the inside of the organization sort of philosophy. What are the things that we can do to grease the skids inside? Why do that, John? To aid execution, okay? Everything a leader does has got to be driven to execute. So cutting the crap wasn't just because it was a cool thing to do, like I said earlier, mm -hmm. killing dumb rules, the things that 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 pissed customers off, the rules and procedures. We had a we had a kill the dumb rules initiative, and uh, and it was the same thing. Cleanse the inside, cleanse the inside. So you will not find right in any textbook or 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 in any paper promulgated by the experts the notion that audacious leaders need to kill dumb rules. You just won't find that. And there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, these people have never run a, a billion dollar a year business. And mm -hmm. secondly, they'd be too damn concerned about the way we express that. And yet communication and the simplicity of communication to resonate with people, players in people, 
What is more important to a leader than to be able to connect? Yeah, Anything? no, I... Yeah, no, I 100% agree. And one one of the things I did some years ago when I was running some businesses is, uh, and I know you talk a lot about business plan and strategy also in the book here, is once we had our business plan uh, for the year, it needed to fit on a one page. So like a, literally a, a one page and and then I laminated it and everybody in the company got a copy of it, post in their workspace. And I said to them, if you on a daily basis, if you ever doing anything that you can't connect to this, then go to your manager and ask them, why am I doing it? And try to empower everybody to see, to be able to, you know, start to cut the crap in their own areas. It's a, it's a great, it's a great process. Uh, I, I, I had somewhat something sim similar um, through, through the strategic game planning process that I, that I had to create as president of this company because I couldn't use traditional methods. And it really was, I can create my strategic game plan by asking three questions. The first question is, how big do you want to be? Mm -hmm. And that's a statement or a declaration of your top line revenue goals, growth over the next 24 months. The second was, uh, who do you want to serve? Which is where are you going to get the money? What are the target customer groups that have the latent potential to give you your growth? And the third is, how are you going to compete and win? And that's all about how you're going to going to outdo the competition. And it led to me creating what I call the only statement. The answer to those three questions literally fits on a half a page. Right. And it's just about just about West. It's not about a bunch of the details. So somebody says, well, Roy, what's your plan? I'd give them that statement. I give them the answer to those three questions. And when I used to go through the workplace, I would say, what's our strategy? And if the, if somebody didn't come back with that simple expression, then that was obviously a coaching moment for me and also a follow-up moment for their man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, I think that's the other thing to do today as well is like you touched upon like the very simple business plan. And that's something else that's become more and more complicated unnecessarily. Uh, uh, and people are, you know, there's all the data stuff, there's this, there's all these other components. People are spending months, you know, putting their business plans together which is a bit ridiculous seen as like you know mother nature could land or whatever land something on us tomorrow and your whole business plan goes up in smoke so that's three or four months wasted like a uh, pandemic. yeah if you like a pandemic um and the other thing is i think people they do the strategy and then they go cool we've done our strategy now back to work <laughs> so so true just a you know you're absolutely dead on a couple of points in there my observation is that people um, are literally blackmailed into spending 80% of their time on the plan and 20% on how to execute it. Mm -hmm. Now, the 80% is all about perfection seeking, which to your point is ridiculous notion. However, the problem, we've been taught to love precision, John. We've been taught that mm -hmm. in school. We continue to be taught to try and be precise. And so that leads to what I call dysfunctional planning behavior, mm -hmm of spending copious amounts of time on the plan and not having any time at all to figure out how you're gonna execute it. I've turned that on its head. So I say, look at my planning process called strategic game planning is all about heading west. It's about getting the plan just about right and spending 80% of my time trying to figure out how I'm gonna execute it. And it's through the execution and learning process that I actually discover where I'm gonna end up. Like you can't when you start the journey, like, right. I'm, I'm sitting in San Diego. I'm going to head North. I got no idea whether I'm going to end up in Vancouver or Blaine, Washington, right. Mm -hmm. Or Calgary, whatever. Okay. So trying to get people comfortable with this notion of ambiguity and just about rightness is a real challenge in today's world when people are being taught to be precise, right? Subject matter experts exist to try and imply precision in an <laughs> imprecise world. I think it's intellectually dishonest. I think it's doing our leaders uh, uh, in, and in part explains why we have mediocre leaders. Yeah, no, I, I agree totally because uh, I, again, like you just said, is um, we live in a world that has decided nuance is, ba is bad and everything needs to be either, you know, A, it's either A or it's B and there's nothing in between. And this is, this is how people have developed their thinking, unfortunately, um, nowadays. And you're right. It's like if we're on this path, 
then we have to lay it out in a very linear, precise fashion. And let's face it, Roy, what the heck in life is linear? Well, look, at you can't formularize humans. You can't formularize business success. You just can't do it. Look, at I got a math degree, uh, which I've never used to solve a real business problem. I mean, I mm -hmm. differential equations kind of got me through with an A at university just because I played the game. But to actually think that, and people still use those tools, like, when they, when they sit down and write forecasts, right? They expect yeah. the future to be a linear extrapolation of what happened in the past. It's like, how freaking screwed up is that thinking, John? <laughs> it's totally screwed up. And so I come in there and I throw a bomb in it, probably a bad choice of example, <laughs> and just say, oh, we're, we're, we're going to get this thing just about right based on the intellectual property in the heads of everybody in this room. Well, I got to tell you, that makes a lot of people feel uncomfortable because most leaders today right, have been taught to expect, right, support and direction from their subordinates, quote unquote, subordinates, right, as opposed to being a leader, right, and, mm -hmm. and, and leading people into the into an unknown future, okay, with imprecision and getting people used to that. I mean, hell, leaders need to introduce discontinuity into the business, not continuity, mm -hmm. because continuity, <laughs> unfortunately, has got inertia written all over it, and we know how well that works out, right? Yeah. And the other thing, Roy, is and 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 you'll uh, this will resonate with you. How many times have you been in an organization or in a in a group where they're doing strategic planning, right? And everybody's coming up with new ideas about what we can do this year and other things we can do. And then you say, "Okay, that's great. Now let's let's take a break and let's focus on what we're going to stop doing, what we're going to get rid of." And suddenly there's silence and everybody's kind of look, what? stop. What? Uh? Nobody ever wants to stop anything because they become almost addicted to it or afraid. If I, if I remove this piece, it's all going to come down like a Jenga puzzle. Well, part, part of the, I think part of the, the, the problem with that, by the way, I absolutely agree with you. I've, I've witnessed it for a hundred years. <laughs> part of the problem is we don't define deletion as part mm -hmm. of the innovation process. OK, what we do is we define innovation and creativity. Read it. Just read anywhere. You will never find innovation and creativity associated with the notion of deleting something mm -hmm. that's no longer relevant or applicable. And I've written a ton of that. It's, there's, there's some pretty interesting stuff in the book. Uh, and I get awful hard on leaders to say, you know, you, you'll, you need to stop doing stuff. Okay, and there's a very practical reason for that. Again, going back to my performance-oriented kind of behavior pattern, mm -hmm. is you can't afford to throw expenses, new expenses at any business these days. You've got to protect your margin. Mm -hmm. So one of the key ways of doing that is to extract costs from the organization uh, from those irrelevant activities and replace them, okay, with activities related to your new strategic plan as opposed to adding on, adding on. Now, the problem with that is, you're now starting to walk on sacred ground. They are what I call momentum managers. These are the people that have been managing the business or programs a certain way. They're part of their DNA and they're threatened if they ever lose them. They have no interests, okay, in the performance of the business. Their only mm -hmm. or interest is themselves. The ultimate narcissist sits in middle management and that's what they do. They protect, they protect, they protect. So what leadership has to do is recognize this behavior is going on and they need to do something about it. What I used to do is I'd take chunks of cost out of people's budgets. Okay, so I take $100,000 out and just say, okay, now you got to you got to run with you got to do everything uh, for, with $100,000 $100, less. I I'm willing to help you try and discover some of the crap that you should yeah. remove from the organization. Okay, but you got $100,000 less less. Well, the whining and sniveling. The, but you know what? The people that basically were creative and, and we're, we're driven to improve the performance of the organization. They figured it out. Yeah, because let's face it, as you know, what, what's the one way most people deal with, uh, deal with situations like this is they just add bodies. It's like throw bodies at it. And, and that's become a mantra here. Like, oh, oh, look at that company. They're growing by X amount of people. And that's supposed to be a success metric. But it could actually be quite the opposite. It could be actually a complete like inefficiency metric. Well, what, what, yeah, I, I agree with you. And, and you know what else they do? They, they take that, that behavior and they describe it as scaling their business. Yeah. They don't even understand what scaling is. Scaling the business means that you get a disproportionate amount of revenue growth from a, a less 
uh, of, a, of an increase in costs. And so your revenues mm -hmm. are running ahead. Your revenue growth are running ahead of your cost growth. Most people don't look, they look at it at exactly what you just said. We're adding costs to the business because we're scaling up. No, no, no. Okay, you don't do it that way. You first of all figure out what do we need to do from a revenue point of view to get 10%, say. Once mm -hmm. you figure that out, then you go to the cost equation and you say, okay, I cannot spend 10% on costs. Otherwise, I'm not scaling the business. Let's grow costs at 5% to get 10% in revenue. Now you're scaling the business. That's not how it works, John. Okay, people mm -hmm. have been taught, let's go at infrastructure first. Let's deal with costs first. Wrong. Absolutely dead wrong. And the reason that, that, that people don't know it is they've never, they've never managed the billion-dollar income statement and had to tell a board that they're growing costs, right, by 30%, but but revenues are going to come in at 50. That's mm -hmm. a tough step. Yeah, yeah. And and the uh, and the one that's been celebrated over the last number of years is oh, add 50% in expense if it gets you 10% increase in revenue because it's all about growth. And and it's funny now. Even if you look at the if you look at the invest or any of the investment analysts now, suddenly they they've suddenly discovered, oh, you need a path to profitability. Uh, last year it was hyper growth, hyper growth, hyper growth. Don't matter about the other part. Uh, and now and that's what I think. It's got to be very interesting for people who've grown up in with this, particularly with this hyper growth mantra. And like, don't worry about the expense side. It's all. It'll all wash out in the end. And now they're confronted with path to profitability and they're like, huh? Well, part part of the problem is people still look at a, 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 a planning horizon that is so that gives mm -hmm. you permission to don't do anything correct within the first 24 months and and believe that you'll actually do it in the 48th month. And so part of my my planning process is like I destroy five year plans they are completely irrelevant. And one of the reasons is they don't lead to the right execution. And so part of my planning process is that we will we will create a growth plan for the next 24 to 36 months, no longer than 36. And I mm -hmm. typically love to go for 24. And the reason for that is you have to do the right thing from the for the problem you just described. OK, you 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 have to figure out how to scale revenues and then cost. You can't get away with saying, oh, well, you know, we're going to keep spending, you know, from an expense point of view, because we'll get it in year four. Because in my system, year four doesn't show up. You got 24 <laughs> um, uh, months and that's the plan. And some people will say, well, you know, that's kind of short sighted. And I say, yeah, execution comes from what you do today, not from what yeah. you think you're going to do 48 months from now. Get over it and let's get going. Yeah, and and although we may be losing money on every product we sell, we'll make it up on volume. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, that's right. I, I, my response to that is not on my watch. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, listen, Roy, this has been great. Again, the book is, let me find the book again here. So I was referencing it, Be Different or Be Dead. Uh, it is... The uh, audacious, unheard of ways I took a startup to a billion in sales. Uh, I would uh, all of Roy's information will be below the video, including the links to the book. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, Roy, please do share a little bit more about yourself with the audience. Well, I'm, you can you can uh, get a hold of me. I've got a website, be different or be dead dot com, and uh, that's my home. It has been since two thousand and nine, which is how long I've been working on this, and most of that with you, John, which I appreciate. Um, so come visit me. I've got uh, resources there for, for, for you. I blog every week and there's pages in there that talks about uh, the seven books I've written and opportunities to learn more about them. And if you want to, it's actually, you can purchase them right off my website. But the other thing I want, the other point I want to make is I also have an email, mm -hmm. you know, roy.osing at uh, gmail.com. I'm really happy, John, to have a conversation with individuals on this journey. And, and, you know, since I've been doing a, a few podcasts, um, people are actually now emailing me their only statement. Roy, I've created this only statement, which is a declaration of competitive advantage that I created, which is in the book. What do you think? And so we have a dialogue around that. And, uh, and uh, you know, they go away and it's free. It's just what I do, paying it forward. They go away with um, hopefully a little better perspective of what competitive advantage is, because I got to tell you, I'm tired of the claptrap out there. I'm tired of companies saying we are the better, we are the best, we're number one, we're market leaders. That's hogwash. 
Okay, you need to figure out your unique at and, and only ones at. Go check out my book. It's in there. It's so important. I just, I can't under, overestimate or overstate its importance to business and careers, by the yeah. way. Absolutely. And, and I can recommend, um, I guarantee you one thing, Roy's books are never boring. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that is one thing about, you know, there's a lot of business books that can be a can be hard graft to get through. Roy's books are always very, very to the point and quite entertaining, too. So I'd highly recommend you check it out. Listen, thanks again for today, Roy. Thank you all for watching and listening. I'll see you all again soon. Yeah.